I feel like to young women, unironically, they need to find a man that's very misogynistic. This problem is so big that it causes everything wrong with society. The, the end goal of feminism and all of these messages is really to keep you, to keep people as childless as possible. Non-virgin women cause all of the world's problems. If I gained a few pounds, she would be like, listen, you're getting fat. This is what mothers should be doing, not worshiping their girls simply for being born female. I mean, it's a strong language, but a form of genocide almost to like Americans, like they don't want you to be stable and happy and raising your own children. I was dominating and I was such a like such a Jezebel. Western women have been told their whole lives that they are so great, that they don't need to change nothing for no man. And if that man doesn't like you for the useless fatty that you are, well, kick him to the curb. He was a misogynist anyway. And this is why we used to have institutions, social shame, and safeguards to protect women from ourselves. Because when the women are it ruins society. When I look at women today, fat, defiant, can't cook, won't clean, they're in huge amounts of debt, they have an inflated sense of self-worth. I look at them and think, why would any man ever show you basic respect that you are clearly incapable of reciprocating? He has completely transformed who I am and how I act because he's such a strong Christian man and he doesn't let me get by on things. He always will nitpick everything because he's literally training me how to be a good Christian wife. You need to be wow. trained. Women are and they need to be trained. So that's my advice. Find a man that will train you. Oh, Christ. Feminism claimed itself everyone's least favorite F word in the age of Mary Wollstonecraft, which is a feat because the word didn't even exist while she was alive. But the concept behind it was stirring a lot of noise at the time. Popular culture posits that a vindication of the rights of women, Wollstonecraft's pioneering novel about white women's educational position in 1790, was received poorly by citizenry at large due to his progressive views. I mean, of course we'd think that. It was 1792, morality wasn't invented until... never, apparently. But in all actuality, the book was highly successful, according to Wikipedia. And I trust Wikipedia, because like TMZ, they are always in the room when shit happens. And of course, if you want to get more pretentious with your sourcing, Katha Pollitt in the 2001 introduction of the novel confirms this. That isn't to say that Wollstonecraft received absolutely no pushback for her views, however. There was a notable objection from Thomas Taylor, a totally normal guy, who immediately published a satire of Wollstonecraft's novel titled A Vindication of the Rights of Brutes, which notoriously asks, if women have rights, why not animals too? I understand that Thomas was trying to be dehumanizing to women by comparing them to animals, but he'd be geeked to have a conversation with a vegan. Kind of the whole point. It wasn't until Mary Wollstonecraft died and her husband, William Godwin, published memoirs of the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women, Jesus Christ, that people really geared up their vitriol against her. It was one thing that Wollstonecraft had so-called progressive views about gender, but it was entirely another that she lived her life in a way that was countercurrent to the traditions of the time. She had an illegitimate child, she had lovers outside of her marriage, and she was suicidal. God forbid a woman has hobbies. Wollstonecraft's lifestyle became pathologized by her community. It infected everything she had done prior to her death, to the point of her academic contemporaries excluding her from their feminist work. Wollstonecraft became a caricature of the ugly, demonic feminist. The stereotype that would grow and gain popularity in the suffragist movement, but in her time was exemplified well by Richard Paulwell's The Unsexed Females. Survey with me what ne'er our fathers saw, a female band despising nature's law, as proud defiance flashes from their arms, and vengeance smothers all their softer charms. I shudder at the new unpictured scene, where unsexed woman vaunts the imperious me. It, is there a translation for this? 
Oh. Alongside being arrested, force-fed in prison, assaulted by police, and smeared by academics, suffragists were also the routine targets of propaganda. Imagery circulated through the 1900s depicted feminists as absent parents, misandrist, domineering wives, and... Uh, demons? I think... I don't know, this looks crazy. According to Alex Q. Arbuckle, women's suffrage was cast by opponents as a threat to the very fabric of society, the integrity of the family, and the security of masculinity itself. This caricature of the man-hating feminist, the anti-mom, the feminine threat to the natural order of the world has persisted and become inseparable from contemporary feminist movements. Take, for instance, the second wave of feminism in the 1960s. This movement is largely distorted by memory and pop culture. We tend to view it as a movement that was pioneered by white women, with women of color coming in late in the game just to complain about being left out. Don't piss me off. Women of color had been fighting for intersectional equality for decades by that point, and were quite active in women's rights groups during the rise of the second wave. Becky Thompson mentions the Mexican-led feminist newspaper, Hijas de Cuatemo, which was founded in 1971. Hijas began conversations about forced sterilization, labor rights, health care, gender discrimination, incarceration, and sexual politics. There was the Asian American group, Asian Sisters, also of the early 70s. This was a group sustained by Asian American college students, often for generation, and they focused on drug abuse intervention for their peers. Other Asian-led organizations advocated against U.S. imperialism, they provided services for abused women, they advocated for refugees and immigrants, and they spotlighted Asian women's cultural and political diversity. Indigenous activists of Turtle Island formed Women of All Red Nations, or WARN, in 1974. And this group protested the forced sterilization of indigenous women. They sued the U.S. government for selling South Dakota's Pine Ridge water to corporations. And they also worked with indigenous activists in Guatemala and Nicaragua. Black feminists were also very much present in the fight for liberation, including their work with the Black Panthers, as they advocated for racial, sexual, and gender equality. And you can't forget about trans, black, and brown women and femmes who were also organizing in the 60s and 70s, with notable riots like the 1969 Stonewall Riot, which began as a protest against police brutality. So yeah, we really misunderstand the second wave of feminism, and a lot of people distance themselves from the politics of that movement because of the omissions. The second wave was also a movement hated at large for its impact on traditional gender roles. It would seem that out of the blue in 1963, Betty Friedan published The Feminine Mystique. It was a book that spoke to the restlessness and dissatisfaction plaguing white housewives across America. Housewives who, whether they wanted to or even could admit it, were oppressed called upon to challenge the problem that has no name, as Fryden put it. Women's organizations began to sprout up locally, statewide, and federally. The movement's main concern was the eradication of sexism, a concern that Becky Thompson argues white feminists considered the most dangerous and damaging oppression of all time. I can excuse racism, but I draw the line at animal cruelty. You can excuse racism. The second wave of feminism sought to raise consciousness about topics such as abortion, STDs, and birth control. It sought to challenge the housewife archetype, and most notably, it advocated for the woman's right to work outside of the home. I mean, this was huge. As Bethany Maris explains, 50s trends of white flight suburbanization, the cult of motherhood underlying the baby boom, and the patriarchal expectation that women were predestined to become homemakers was persistent at this time. So you can imagine the backlash. Conservatives especially challenged the feminist critique of the housewife. Among them, Phyllis Schlafly was a prominent anti-feminist during this era. Her opposition to the Equal Rights Amendment was instrumental, and she often liked to start her speeches with the quote, I'd like to thank my husband for letting me be here tonight. I always like to say that because 
It makes the libs so mad. The image of the ugly, anti-motherhood, anti-family feminist remains a century later. In fact, this image has become the mortal enemy of a new set of spectators, not entirely unlike those of the past, the trad wives. Tradwife is just one word that spawned from a combination of two, traditional and wife. Really, it means exactly what you think it means. Cis-hetero women marrying cis-hetero men with the express understanding that their marriage will feature traditional gender roles. The wife is a homemaker and a child rearer. The husband is a worker and a financer, which is fine. I feel like I had to just get that out of the way right now. It's fine. From the outside looking in though, Trad wives seem cloistered in an idyllic fog of 1950s interest. They often use 50s advertisements in their aesthetic videos. They tend to adore 50s fashion. And of course, their embracement of strict gender roles reminds us of 50s politics. Brett Cooper is right in saying that trad gender roles have existed forever and that it's silly to compare trad wives exclusively to the 50s. But Brett is also ignoring a lot of context, which I guess Brett is used to. The 50s marked a return to tradition after the war, and white middle-class women largely went back to homemaking after their husbands returned. Gender roles have always existed, but they were also re-emphasized during this time in an effort to rebalance the natural order the natural order. <laughs> Another reason trad wives are so connected to 1950s glamour is because of Elena Petit's 2020 BBC interview. A self-declared trad wife, Petit stated on air that her lifestyle consisted of submitting to and spoiling her husband like it's 1959. Shortly after this interview, the search results for trad wife skyrocketed and the community began to expand. Because most people's initial introductory to trad wifery was Petit's interview, it's natural for the 1950s image to stick. The internet trad wife looks a lot like a modest mommy blogger. She wears long prairie dresses or 50s housewife garb. She posts recipes and child caring tips. And she has a well honed aesthetic that draws in viewership. And again, that's fine. <laughs> Stay at home moms and housewives are powerhouses and it's a profession that deserves respect, but that's not who we're critiquing here. Not every stay-at-home mom or housewife is a trad wife. Trad wifery is, in my opinion, an ideology, not just a profession. It's a specific term for a specific community who have specific ideals. And while that community shares visual traits with stay-at-home moms and housewives, trad wives are strictly distinguished by their politics. So. Don't feel guilty if you enjoy these hobbies. A lot of people are drawn to these communities because they enjoy that slow, cozy lifestyle of baking and homemaking and caring for others. Liking these things is not the issue here. In fact, I like a lot of the basics of these traits too, especially when they're featured in the sponsor of today's video, Love and Pies. Listen, Love and Pies has to be the coziest game I've ever played. And if you have a mobile phone or a tablet, you can download it for free and see what I'm talking about. From the moment I downloaded Love and Pies, I was invested, okay? They don't just have a storyline going. They have lore. The game follows Amelia, who you play as, and she's a single mom who works too hard, who loves her kids and never stops. They come to visit Amelia's mom, only to find that her mom's cafe is falling apart. It had a fire, some telenovela firefighters had to put it out, and afterwards, Amelia can't find her mom anywhere. It's up to Amelia to run her mom's cafe, serve customers, create a thriving business, all while rebuilding and redecorating as she goes. And on top of that, she's still gotta find her mom. She is girl bossing too close to the sun. Everything is incredibly immersive. The graphics and animations are high quality. The music is soothing and the game is really easy to get the hang of. And you guys know I love a design element. I build a lot of my own sets or I choose spaces that thematically represent my scripts or that look good. 
And Love and Pies is another way for me to exercise that passion by letting me design Amelia's Cafe exactly the way I want it. After a long day of filming or during breaks from writing tough scripts, I like to cuddle on the couch or climb in bed with my cats and get to merging. The best part is Love and Pies never goes stale. It constantly has new events, and tons of great rewards. If you're watching at the time of upload and you're thinking about downloading, make sure to check out their winter-themed picnic pass live and their brand new Christmas event. Every time you pass a level, just, just think of me playing right there alongside you. I'm beating you, by the way. I'm, I'm 18,000 levels ahead of you and you'll never catch up, but that's just because I'm competitive in a cozy, sweet, and daring way. I'm really excited to hear from you guys and how you like the game. Make sure to embrace the cozy season with Love and Pies. Decorate your own charming cafe on iOS and Android. Thank you to Love and Pies for sponsoring. Now, let's get back to the video. We covered the Tradwife to Alt-Right pipeline in a video I posted one week ago, titled Tradwives and the White Supremacist Who Love Them. In it, we discussed the underlying politics, and some would argue goals, of some Tradwives within the community. Drawing inspiration from organizational efforts of the 1920s WKKK, some conservative Tradwives seek to inject their politics within their unassuming aesthetic content. And once platformed with an audience, some conservative Tradwives begin funneling their audience toward increasingly more alt-right views. Various members of the conservative tradwife community are also expressly anti-feminist. I would argue that the rhetoric they use today mirrors the rhetoric of anti-feminist philosophy of the past. They characterize feminism as something that ruined the nuclear family and the housewives who enjoyed it, as well as something that ruined the way women are viewed and protected in society. A Tradwife YouTuber posted a video in February 2019 that argued how feminism was marginalizing feminine women in society. She lamented the age of the beauty magazine and homemaker literature, stating that media aimed at women nowadays features feminism instead of things women actually care about." End quote. Another Instagram Tradwife wrote about feminism. Feminists want to do whatever they want without having to deal with the consequences that come with freedom. With female liberation comes consequences. Another Tradwife post reads, feminist wife versus Christian wife. The husband coming home from work says, did you make some food for dinner? The evil green haired feminist wench replies, shut up sexist pig, you have a hand, cook it yourself. I'm not your slave. <laughs> While the Christian Tradwife has, uh, what is that? She has food, I guess, and says, Hey honey, how was work? I was so missing you. I just made us a delicious dinner. I love you. This fits in thematically with anti-suffragist propaganda, though it is modernized for today's meme society. It depicts feminist wives as absent, emotional, and man-hating. And you can't forget about the green hair and pronouns. Hey, I'm just saying. Well, what else are they saying about me? what feminism actually accomplished for women. Burnout and stress, emasculated men, neglected children, cheap sex and no commitment, a holocaust of babies, and devalued contribution as wives and mother. Another states, if you're a feminist, you don't love babies as much as feminine women. Feminists want to be child free. Feminists want careers over children. Feminists want independence and not marriage or parenthood. Feminists value money and power over the responsibility of raising kids. I think you get the point with these. The Tradwife community also has a religious aspect. To some conservative Christian Tradwives, Feminists are the antithesis of their own values. These values stem largely from a biblical understanding of gender and marriage roles. All right, parishioners, turn to Ephesians 5.22. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. And now, 1 Peter 3.7. Husbands, Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Parishioners, Genesis 3.16. Why am I going backwards? <laughs> to the woman, he said, 
I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing, and pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. And next, 1 Timothy 2.12. I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. <clears throat> and finally, Galatians 3.28. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. This biblical understanding of gender roles and wifely submission informs a lot of the rhetoric present in track wife media. It can explain why so much of it is, you know, the way it is. One trad wife posted on Twitter, in a world full of women teaching their children that their only goal is to go to university, get a good job and make money, I'm teaching my little girl to live a slow life, to be a biblical woman that wants a husband and a beautiful family she can serve daily. And the text on the accompanying video is, I'm teaching my daughter that it's perfectly acceptable to depend on a man. On Instagram, one trad wife writes, the wife who believes that sex is just sex may tend to make excuses for depriving her husband sexually. She may be pleased with herself, but God is not. Oh brother, this guy stinks! She follows this up with, ladies, if you truly love your husband and desire an emotional connection with him, be generous, anticipate his needs, and be quick to give of yourself. This is the core of my trad wife criticism. It's not so much the 50s garb or desire for gender roles that turn outsiders off, but more so the enforcement of those gender roles and to what extent those gender roles are performed. A lot of people just have issues with the terminology like that of serve and submission, but listen, I'm not kink shaming. <laughs> I think my issue with the language surrounding trad wifery is that it implies that the trad wife's body does not belong to her so much as it belongs to the house, husband, and kids. We see this not only in posts demanding wives to have sex with their husbands no matter what, or the post claiming that refusing to have sex with your husband is a form of abuse, nor the quotes that claim that marital rape is a myth, but we also see it in posts condemning women who live child-free or husband-free lifestyles. One trad wife wrote that being a single woman is not a blessing, it's a curse. The blessing comes when the father blesses you with your head slash husband. Then you can fulfill your purpose. On the topic of childbirth, another trad wife wrote, not wanting kids is weird and is a, sorry. Not wanting kids is weird and is a cultural or emotional defect. We were made for relationships and are literally biologically wired to have children. It's entirely unnatural to not want them. The conservative idea of gender essentialism implicitly states that women don't have a choice when it comes to being a wife or a mother. They have to be these things because it's their biological purpose. And if they're not these things or not planning to be these things, then there is something defective about them. As Sittler Elbow argues, the logic of some conservative trad wives is that a woman not only stays home because she wants to be domestically focused, but because she, as a woman, must cater to and take care of her husband in these ways. I want to be clear that my issue is not strictly with tradition in the broad sense, because I know how to mind my business. I care more so about the extreme examples of this logic that is posted to the internet, where the language of tradition, just like religion, is manipulated and made extreme. I care about the rhetoric that might be internalized by young women viewing this content. Rhetoric that will tell her that she's a bad Christian if she doesn't want to have sex with her husband all the time. Does that mean you're not attracted to your husband? Does that mean you don't love your husband? There are a myriad of different reasons why someone wouldn't want to have sex at any given moment that have nothing to do with love or attraction. Let people have those reasons. I also care about the rhetoric that tells women they are incomplete without birthing children. 
that not wanting them or not even having them makes them traitors to their biology. This is a viewpoint that is wholly dismissive to millions of people. Trans women, infertile women, women with FGM. It's rhetoric that harms the black and brown women who did want to give birth to children, but who were forcibly sterilized due to medical racism. It harms the mothers who have lost children, who had miscarriages or stillbirths or horrible accidents. Mothers outside of Western countries who have had their children taken away from them, who are unable to be the comfortable trad wives of the internet because they're too busy being beaten down by imperialism and war. And even if we took all of that off the table, this rhetoric would still be harmful to people who just don't want to have children because that is just as valid of a reason as any. Again, let me reiterate, the problem is not that women choose to be housewives or stay-at-home mothers. The problem is not even that they decide to serve their husbands. The problem is the politics behind this behavior and the rhetoric that calls for women to alienate themselves from their own bodies to become a permanent vessel for everyone else but herself. Boop, devil's advocate, uh, but isn't it a choice. Like soldiers in war, these trad wives are sacrificing themselves for the greater good of their country. I mean, how feminist can you be if you don't even believe in choice feminism? This was a phrase coined by Linda Hirschman, and it essentially means that feminism gave women the choice to choose their lifestyles. Therefore, any possible choice they make is inherently feminist. Michael L. Ferguson separates choice feminism into three parts. First, it understands freedom as the capacity to make individual choices and oppression as the inability to choose. Therefore, if a woman is able to say that she has chosen something, as trad wives do in defense of their lifestyles, choice feminism views her ability to choose as an expression of her liberation. Second, Ferguson goes on, since the only criterion for evaluating women's freedom is individual choice, we should abstain from judging the content of the choices women make. All choices are equally expressions of her freedom and therefore equally to be supported. Applying this logic to trad wives, one may argue that because their lifestyle is their choice, then it is impossible to morally judge the content of that lifestyle, such as any extremist views of gender submission or at times biblical inferiority. If they are choosing it, it cannot be oppression. Finally, Ferguson argues, choice feminism implies that we live in a post-feminist world where the women's movement did all it needed to liberate women. And now women are totally free to make whatever choices they make without oppression. Yeah, but that final stage of choice feminism assumes that choices are made in a vacuum. That because of the victories of past feminism, there is not a choice available to women now that could degrade or oppress them. Essentially, it's a political view that seeks to separate us from the broader systems that influence us. Listen to this. This means, says Ferguson, that choice feminism obscures how our choices are shaped for us. If the popular idea amongst conservative Christian trad wives is that biblical submission is the most moral stance one can take, and that refusing to follow the biblical destiny for women makes them a disappointment in the eyes of God, one may argue, are they truly choosing the trad wife lifestyle? or are they choosing the option that gets them less eternal damnation? And this goes for a lot of different choices. If we are told one thing all our life and we grow up into the expectation of being or doing that thing, is it an organic choice? 
If your dad is a basketball coach and he primes you year in and year out for all of your childhood that basketball is life, that it is the only thing that will get you anywhere in your career, that it is all you should be training for, and you grow up to be a basketball player, will that have been an organic choice? Or will you realize after singing with a new girl at a summer gig that music is truly your calling and that you want to go to Juilliard but your dad doesn't get it and in one exploding screaming match you tell him basketball is your dream dad not mine <sighs> where was i going with that oh yeah choice feminism also fails to consider who is actually able to make choices especially along racial sexual and class lines for instance, a lot of black, brown, and impoverished women were never afforded the illusion of choice between being a housewife or being in the labor force. Their choice was made for them for most of this country's history. The inability to understand what choice truly means in a world of influence and ingrained systemic oppression leads us to view individual choices as moral wins or moral failures, much like we discussed in my anti-aging video. Furthermore, a lot of the choiced feminist anti-feminists are very critical of giving choices to people they don't agree with and are certainly content with living individualistic lives. One trad wife is quoted as saying that maternity leave should not be lengthened. We need to stop normalizing leaving your children to go to work. Not only does this not support the right to choose, but it also ignores the importance of instilling rights for people who don't live the same life as you. Not everyone is able to be a stay-at-home parent because not everyone can survive off of one income in this economy. No matter how much you tell them to budget and live within their means, low-income households are suffering right now since they spend more of their income on necessities for survival than any other class. Necessities that have become pricier with higher than average inflation and price gouging. As of April 2023, prices in the US are almost 20% higher than they were in January of 2019. Not only that, but according to CNBC, lower income households have fewer ways to reduce or change their spending habits due to much of their spending going to survival. And they have less in savings or investment accounts to fall back on. Middle class households are also not making money as fast as the increasing price of living, leading to a harder time of living similar lifestyles that previous middle class generations enjoyed. Generations, might I add, that tried wives largely romanticize online. So yeah, sometimes a household requires two incomes, and even that may not be enough with the rising cost of living. And so women who have children should be allowed to have them and support them without being penalized through misogynistic work clauses such as short maternity leave. This individualistic viewpoint is not only depressing, but directly endangers people who you view as different from you. And I can't emphasize this enough. You should care about those people. The invitation to leave one another alone is really an invitation to leave the current unjust arrangement in place, Hirschman argues. Further in line with anti-choice conservative trad wives, let's talk politics. A lot of the conservative trad wives I've researched for this video series are anti-immigration, which takes away the choice not only for everyone wanting to immigrate for whatever reason, but especially mothers and wives who wish to do so for the betterment of their family. And before you come in with the argument, well, why can't they just do it through the system? Do you actually know any immigrants? Immigrants from majority brown countries especially? Do you know what the system looks like? How exploitative it is? How hard it is for people to just do it by the book? Or do you get all of your opinions from Bob on Twitter who has never had to do something hard a day in his life. Conservative trad wives are also pro-life and anti-choice when it comes to abortion, sometimes even in the case of rape or incest. 
Some of them are against the choice for same-sex marriage, against their children's choices to learn their own views, against the choice for people to advocate for human rights they call woke, against the choice for people to not want kids. Some of them are against the choice of a wife to decide if she wants to have sex with her husband at any given moment or not. And some are even against the choice of women to vote. Don't ask your husband how you should vote. First, ask him if he even wants you to. Don't assume. To weaponize choice feminism when one, you don't even support feminism, and two, you yourself are incapable of supporting the choices of others, is ironic. The feminism that trad wives are more aligned with is neo-feminism, which Sittler Elpin describes as the empowerment of women by praising and valuing essentially feminine characteristics and acknowledgement of a difference from men. Now, I don't personally agree with neo-feminism, mainly because I don't believe in essentializing gender. I also think it's not in anyone's best interest to allow the argument of fundamental differences between social classes to run rampant. This language can be used to dehumanize entire groups of people, especially in an individualistic society where if we deem someone different from us, we will do everything in our power to exercise our perceived right to squash them into the ground. USA, USA. We have seen past and present movements target people they view as innately different or alien from them. And we have seen spectators turn a blind eye to the extermination of those groups because they too buy into the narrative of fundamental differences. It happened during chattel slavery when white enslavers said that black people were biologically different from whites and that difference made them inferior and designed for subjugation. It happened during the Holocaust when Jewish people were considered biologically inferior to the point of being compared to rats. And it's happening now all across the world in different genocides from Palestinians to the Uyghurs. Especially in the alt-right movement, the power of difference is palpable. It's the entire basis of the white nationalist, white supremacist ideology. And women in these factions are not immune to that sort of dehumanization. For instance, one conservative Twitter user stated, conservative women have been fighting feminism, fighting abortion, and fighting for traditional values for years and making real progress, only to have right-wing men turn on us in 2023, bitterly blaming all women for what's wrong in society. It's such an incredible betrayal. Another user replied, and this is exactly why the majority of my tweets are aimed at men. It's not that my views have changed. I don't hate men. I don't like what feminism has done. I have spent years defending men against the vitriol being spewed at them by women only to feel betrayed. These same men are calling me ungodly names, telling me women are essentially second-class citizens. So there's obviously a lot one can say about this, so much. Uh, if you say anything about my bonnet, you hate black people. But a lot of people pointed out in my last video how trad wives are pygmies in the sense that they are willing to degrade other women so long as they themselves are upheld by men and society. And yeah, I think that applies here, but I would also bring back Mariana Ortega's reference to the arrogant perceiver. And this is something we discussed in my TikTok femininity video. While usually a cis man, the arrogant perceiver can be anyone. Their job is to analyze the culture around them. They determine what makes a woman good or invaluable. They determine her race, her mannerisms, her way of dress. And these determinations are solely based on the level of satisfaction the perceiver receives. If they like modest women, then all women should be modest. If they only like white women, then whiteness becomes a default for femininity. The arrogant perceiver determines what makes an ideal, and the person being perceived must then embody that ideal. Ortega argues that women who participate in being the arrogant perceiver themselves possibly do so out of a need for survival. She states, the arrogant eye gives the world intelligibility, and thus, women want to be inside the web of meaning the arrogant eye creates. But all this does is reinforce a system of hierarchy and purposefully unobtainable aspirations. 
It supports the notion of self-correction as liberation instead of system correction as liberation. Tradwives are trying desperately to fit into the world of the arrogant eye because that is what feels most safe to them. And that's kind of the issue here. They don't care about other people's safety, just their own. You see this in how they respond to certain criticisms. For instance, when people ask, what happens if your husband leaves you? What happens if your husband is abusive? Which we'll get to later. They will reply, well, it won't happen to me because I picked a good man. Out of everything that implies, <laughs> there's also an implied ellipsis at the end of the sentence there. Like, I picked a good man in comparison to, which we can draw back to say where Darby's argument, uh, about trad wife politics. What you'll realize is it's as much about what it's against as what it's for. I'm feminine, not feminist, right? And so seeding these ideas that, you know, you want to be like me, um, you know, look how great my life is. Children love me, men love me. Like, look how celebrated I am in comparison to. I'm safe because I believe in self-correction over system correction. Anyone who does find themselves in an abusive marriage with nowhere to go only has themselves to blame. That is kind of what you get from that argument. So yeah, I hate to use the term pick me here because it feels too lukewarm of a word for this kind of mindset. And in that case, I really do appreciate Ortega's theory. With that being said, I'm not going to sit here and pretend that every argument levied against trad wives is valid. There are people who view housewifery as oppressive no matter the circumstance. People who view being a stay-at-home mom, anti-feminist to its core. And I don't agree with those people. I also think they're missing the point. I think, as Livia Gershon does, that we should be careful with how we view these positions and make sure to distinguish between misery of being a housewife in general and misery that stems from mistreatment and unappreciation that housewives may receive from their family or society. I think a big issue we're missing from the debate of housewife versus feminist girl boss is not the individual players, but the society that makes being either one so insufferable. Neither of them truly win or outpace the other because no one in the society does. <laughs> Women who want kids have to give up their careers because of workplace discrimination that forces them to choose. It's illegal to discriminate against pregnant people, yeah, but some workers are still not given long enough maternity leave, nor are they given proper accommodations to do their jobs while pregnant. And you know, capitalism fucking sucks. On the other side of it, housewives are preemptively blamed for their own homelessness or hunger if their husbands happen to leave them in the future. They're constantly asked on social media, if your husband leaves you, how will you and your kids survive? And the question is valid, sure, but it's never asked for the right reason. I understand that trad wives carry an ideology that is harmful, to say the least, to the greater good of people, but they're still people and their kids are people. This line of questioning and the underpinning of perfect victimhood ignores the controversial fact that no one should be left destitute, not the wife nor the kids. It also ignores the fact that tradwives are not the only dependent class. There are people who are unable to work due to disability or other life circumstances who depend on crowdfunding or family help in order to stay alive. And there are women and people who simply work in the house because it's what they want for themselves and what they want for their families. Those people shouldn't be left homeless or hungry or dead just because they depend on other people. It says more about our capitalistic society and the individualism that pervades conversations about making a living that someone could be left homeless or hungry for any reason and then blamed for it. I would think that if we were to be feminist, if we cared about the liberation of everyone, we should also care about the systems that require you to work to the bone to be able to afford basic human necessities in the first place. We should be wary of placing moral failure on people who depend on someone else's income, whether it be a housewife, a disabled person, or what have you. And, comma, we can also be critical of conservative trad wives 
who believe their witch hunt politics will save them from the fire. It's possible to have all of these conversations at once. Neither one of them take away from the other. <sighs> but y'all don't want to hear me. You just want to dance. Let's get into some toe mail. Anonymous writes, to be fair, online conversations on feminism and labor do tend to be strange and unpleasant. Too many leftists forget that at-home work is work too and needs to be fairly compensated. Too many uh, single-issue feminists assume the labor discourse is more about the vibes than about money. When a woman is tired, confused, exploited at her workplace, exploited at home, where is she supposed to turn? I think that solidarity among women means we have to accept that some women do at-home labor exclusively. There's a whole slew of cultural reasons, disability reasons, complicated family situations, and yes, also religious reasons why that is so. Whether it was a choice for the woman initially or not is not really worth dwelling on. The question is more, what choices do housewives have going forward? What can they do if they want to stop being housewives for whatever reason? Do they have the same basic protection every worker deserves? If a housewife wants to leave all the big decisions to the husband, sure, fine, but what happens to her if she changes her mind? In an ideal world, choice feminism would provide more choices to people. Another user wrote in with a mixture of their thoughts and their mother's thoughts. For context, their mother is currently a stay-at-home mom, and before getting pregnant, she worked in toxicology. Her husband made more money at the time, and she felt that it was unsafe to continue working around toxins while pregnant, so she decided to stay home. The user's mother states, What should I think about this topic? Americans are weird and cultist. We all know that. <laughs> Very true. And besides, if this is one of those housewives versus feminist discourses again, I don't want to do it. I think telling women they don't belong in the kitchen is just as misogynistic as saying they do. The user goes on to add their own opinion. So many women want to be trad wives, not because they feel happiness in staying home all day long, but rather because the feeling of having someone take care of you in the capitalistic hellhole we live in is just too good to even try and fight against. I feel as though if all trad wives would admit that deep down, most of them just do it because they can't bear to live a never ending circle of poor working conditions, which results to just the minimum wage for hard labor, we could start a revolution. Keep in mind, this is the opinion of a middle-class European teen and her mom. I do not know how it applies to America. A 27-year-old law student wrote in from India, and she explains how she was born in a very progressive and feminist family, but at the same time, very sheltered and isolated from the deeply patriarchal society of North India. This user states that she and other women of her generation were given considerable freedom due to being from white collar and metropolitan families. They were given quality education and were always encouraged to have careers, but only in respectable industries like medicine, engineering, law, and etc. Even with these beliefs, she and other women are still expected to get married and be traditional. Traditional in this context, the user states, means a woman who adheres to traditional Hindu values and our culture, i.e. she wears traditional Indian clothes, is dedicated toward performing domestic labor without expecting anything in return, and is overall docile, tolerant, patient, forgiving. Even though we have a lot more women joining the workforce, albeit in white collar jobs, the gendered expectations still retain and ambitious women on average face a tough time socially. There's a very limited range of personality traits that are tolerated for them to have, and anyone not strictly adhering to that range is isolated, if not ostracized. Not to say that your average Indian woman is boring or doesn't have interests or hobbies, but they are, one, incentivized to overlook them in favor of their family slash marriage, and two, there are no real avenues for women with interests and hobbies to form meaningful communities and groups, except for your traditionally gendered hobbies like cooking and shopping. Even a woman following the conventional route of marriage and kids who might have a distinct interest that she follows every now and then, like sports, is asked to grow up and be mature. I know that there is a lot more to the issue, but there is also an element of tradition that is at play here. This is what I think is the main problem of the trad wife content even in Western countries. The women at the forefront are almost always deeply privileged women who have no real conception of a life of political deprivation and are very much taking whatever little power they have for granted. 
I'm not saying that these women don't face misogyny, discrimination, or other sexist things, but they experience them with significantly less dire consequences than majority of women who don't even have a fraction of the social security that these women might enjoy. Perpetuating such ideas without any sensitivity is dangerous to people who actually need the political gains from feminist movements more. Do anti-feminists actually know what feminism is? Or do they cherry pick tenements that are the most different from their lifestyle in order to write the whole thing off? The feminism present in conservative circles is interesting, mainly because it focuses on such a narrow view of feminism. It's like conservative tradwise read spark notes up until the point of the second wave and closed the browser. This narrow view of feminism is kind of sad, especially in the sense of what that last toe submission said. Crusading against feminism because of your very limited understanding of it not only endangers you and your rights, but it also endangers the countless people who do need to be advocated for. That activism doesn't just stop at the feminism versus housewives debate or abortion or contraception, but it covers a myriad of different issues. Angela Davis said something that I highly agree with, and that is, feminism is not something that adheres to bodies, not something grounded in gendered bodies, but it is an approach a way of conceptualizing as a mythology, as a guide to strategies for struggle. That means that feminism doesn't belong to anyone in particular. We have to approach liberation as a collective feat, not an individual one. Barbara Smith said that feminism is the political theory and practice to free all women. Women of color, working class women, poor women, disabled women, lesbians, old women, as well as white, economically privileged, heterosexual women. Anything less than this is not feminism, but merely female self-aggrandizement. We must be committed to fighting for trans women, imprisoned women, women under the threat of imperialism and colonization and war, women everywhere and we must make the connections to further understand that we can't just stop there. I would like for conservative tradwives, if they are going to be anti-feminist, to at least dedicate the time to learning more about feminism and the plights of women outside of their own worldview. I would like for them to consider that not everyone can exist without fighting for their own liberation. I would like for them to challenge the idea that every woman is as safe and as unneeding of activism and woke politics as they are. And I would like for them to think critically of this video, not as an attack on them or their profession, but as an appeal to rethink their politics. Leopards like faces. They don't discriminate against whose face they eat, even if you vote for them. It might be in your best interest to find other ways to protect yourself. Thank you guys for watching and thank you for a year filled with contemplation, silly outfits, <laughs> and endearing community. I love you guys and I will see you in 2024.